to the audience, and then you have the floor for, for Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the day two of Russia Seminar 2023. And, and uh, we have the privilege to, to, to broaden our views around Ukraine, and, and we will hear the first presentation, the first keynote speech from Ukraine, from Kiev, by Andrei Hritsenko. And he's, uh, uh, he, he has graduated from the Kaliningrad Naval College and, and, and joining after that uh, to, to Ukrainian Navy, and especially to the uh, naval, naval intelligence, especially. And in 2000, he graduated from the National Defense Academy of Ukraine and, and joined the postgraduate school. In 2004, he defended his uh, doctoral dissertation and, and uh, on, on military science. And 2009, he, he was in the United States and graduated from the Naval War College in Newport. And after that, he was back in the uh, naval intelligence in Ukraine. And since 2012, 10 years ago, he, he has been serving as a deputy chief of the Naval Department of the National Defense University in Kiev. And he will speak about the military political and military strategic situation around the Black Sea and Caspian Sea, and, 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 and a few words about the prospects of the future, what is to come. Uh, Andre, the floor is yours, please. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Sorry. I, I think I spoke about the wrong person. Is Andre there or are, are you going to speak the... The, the presentation. I I, I can he see that the, the, this is called Stepan Yakimiak. Uh, Sorry, uh, I, I personally I don't know you, so I have to guess. Uh, really, I have uh, from my uh, and I give you from the uh, but not Stefan, uh, he was yesterday, and uh, today I will speak to you from the count. Is it okay? Sorry, the the voice is is, is uh, uh, to me at least it's it's not understandable. I, just pl partly I can hear you. Every word, every now and then. Could you please speak to the clearly to the microphone? Okay, I try. Uh, If I understood you correctly, uh, Andre is not there, and you will be speak about he in his turn. Or uh, 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 it's possible. I uh, can speak uh, uh, for the presentation from. Uh, 
Das ist Kosten. Yo, 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 off, yo, leave me. Yo, you, you can, you can use it. Okay, it's, it was my, my mistake. I, I, it's clarified now. You, you can speak, please. Of course. He's really, okay. he's the and Andre. That's for sure. I got intel information about oh, okay. Yeah. okay, please. But please speak to the clearly to the microphone. Uh, okay. Now Thank it's you. better. Now it's better. Oh. So, what about the Russian policy in the Black Sea and the uh, Caspian Sea region? Um, so, we know the uh, main uh, game players, main actors, in, uh, which are present in uh, this region, are the first of all, uh, it's Russia. Uh, Russia, uh, Russian policy uh, during uh, last um, centuries uh, were uh, directed uh, on this, uh, this uh, region is very, very, very cold. Uh, but not also Russia uh, 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 play uh, games in this region. Also, uh, Russian interests uh, in this region uh, across to the uh, Interests uh, of uh, other uh, important uh, play gamers, such as uh, Nature and uh, United uh, European Union, uh, European Union members, such as uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Turkey. Uh, other sides. The interest of China in these uh, regions uh, uh, sometimes um, uh, not um, not um, uh, compare with the Russian uh, interest. Other side, uh, Moldova. Uh, Ukraine and Georgia uh, have uh, 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 absolutely um, different interests in, uh, than Russia in this region. Uh, Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia is a um, competition nation in these regions. Uh, uh, and uh, sometimes they are uh, stay the enemy nations on, on uh, others. And uh, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, this region play very important role, uh, especially in the uh, Caspian Sea uh, region. So, and uh, uh, Iran in this region uh, uh, now uh, supports Russia, uh, particularly um, uh, by, uh, by the Russia uh, unmanaged. Because also uh, uh, policy in the Black Caspian Sea regions um, traditionally uh, uh, based on uh, peace uh, uh, points. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, uh, the importance of uh, these regions for Russia uh, explains uh, that the Russia um, uh, uh, have uh, mind that uh, the enemy fleets uh, may be present, uh, uh, present in the Black Sea and uh, is this fleet for Russia. The, uh, region. Also, uh, uh, regions um, are an area for source projection uh, on both the Middle East, North Africa, and uh, especially uh, Balkans, which uh, 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 which. Uh, Often uh, Russia uh, uh, says that the uh, Balkans is uh, territory of uh, Russian influence. Uh, and the projection, the force projection on the uh, Balkan region is the uh, main direction of Russian policy in uh, 18 and 19 uh, centuries and also in uh, 20th century. Now, uh, Russian uh, has, uh, intent has the project uh, for us on uh, Mediterranean and the uh, Balkans from the uh, Black Sea region and the region too. Uh, next point is the uh, maritime trade and export of energy resources. It's uh, very important for us uh, because Russian Sea ports and uh, ports of uh, first uh, 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 in Crimea uh, help to uh, above the uh, social persons in the uh, general territory regions. Uh, also, uh, black and testing sea resources exploring is the, uh, is the next point of uh, Russian policy in this uh, and logistics too. Logistics too, the commercial logistics and the military logistics. Uh, as it's known, uh, the Caspian Sea is the uh, transport uh, magistral from uh, uh, iron uh, weapons, which uh, uh, transfer from Iran to Russia. Oh, no trouble. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Russian methods of influence on the situation in Black and Caspian Sea uh, region. First of all, uh, Russian situation uh, accumulates the uh, military uh, potential in uh, this region. In this region. It's the growth of uh, Russian military force. Uh, uh, other ways, it's a uh, political, uh, political uh, method, um, uh, yeah. uh, such as uh, political um, pressure on uh, political actors in this region. Uh, also, forming um, the uh, uh, 
important uh, zone of important um, uh, important interest uh, of uh, Russian Federation um, uh, or uh, forming of a uh, gray zone. Uh, gray zone is in, in these regions um, uh, which uh, uh, directed uh, uh, don't allow uh, presence of uh, NATO forces in this uh, region. First of all, uh, other way is them uh, using uh, politics uh, of uh, frozen conflict in this uh, region. Uh, other one, uh, it's uh, uh, political uh, gaming with um, uh, secret. Uh, NATO uh, nations in these regions, well, for example, such as uh, Turkey. Uh, otherwise, it's um, information base. It's a propaganda, a cyber attacks, also economics uh, methods, uh, and uh, energy. Uh, this energy uh, is positive. So, <laughs> energy transportation system of uh, Black and Caspian Sea region, as you can see uh, at this uh, uh, slide, and we can see that uh, very, very much. Uh, uh, world important uh, uh, leaks of energy uh, there are uh, present. Nabucco uh, 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 other uh, and uh, uh, this region is important for uh, policy uh, for uh, European policy uh, because uh, 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 Crimea in the Russian uh, uh, political uh, uh, has a very important role uh, right now and uh, historically uh, because the Crimea is the uh, key point of Russian aggression against Ukraine and the uh, influence on uh, uh, other uh, political gamers in uh, uh, these uh, both regions. Uh, also, Russia uh, uh, say that. Um, uh, Real threats, uh, uh, real threats um, in this region. Um, uh, uh, direct Russian uh, politics and the uh, death uh, uh, on full scale. Uh, armed uh, aggression against the Ukraine. And uh, Russia uh, uh, in the uh, next uh, future uh, will uh, take uh, positions in uh, this region. Uh, taken uh, Crimea, taken Crimea. So, during uh, uh, 2014 uh, till 2022, uh, Russian Federation uh, rose in a whole military presence. Uh, uh, 
Chinese, and you can see uh, all, uh, all uh, military formation which you uh, can search in China uh, and uh, which was created in Crimea after uh, 2014. Um, uh, uh, the main and conflicts in Black and Caspian regions in this line, and the Russian uh, the support uh, by supporting these you know, frozen conflicts uh, have an um, uh, intention. So, uh, take uh, uh, this uh, countries, you know, uh, regional countries uh, in a sphere of uh, own influence. Uh, uh, such uh, countries as uh, Georgia, uh, Ukraine, Republic uh, of uh, uh, Moldova. Uh, 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 countries which Russia uh, tend uh, to keep in the sphere uh, of uh, influence. Uh, so, uh, then, uh, uh, national interests of uh, our country, the Black and Caspian Sea region, regions, uh, is to uh, uh, provide um, uh, the fundamental interests with uh, uh, renew uh, territorial uh, territory of, uh, of Ukraine. In this region, including uh, returns of control uh, for uh, Crimea Peninsula. Uh, and also, uh, uh, to our interest, uh, it's um, uh, provide um, uh, protective from achieve don uh, to. Uh, maritime trade uh, ways, maritime ways, uh, also guarantees of uh, control uh, under uh, exclusive uh, maritime economic zone and uh, using our resources. The best way uh, for our country. Uh, to achieve this national interest is the uh, take part in the uh, NATO European Europe. Uh, also, uh, what is the NATO's uh, marriage? And uh, the uh, Black and Siri. Uh, uh, maybe it um, uh, was particularly uh, successful. Uh, some of them uh, 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 strongly of um, Eastern. Uh, Southeastern flank of the NATO. It's uh, in, uh, decrease in uh, probability of uh, Russian provocation uh, against uh, NATO uh, nation in the uh, uh, Black Sea region, first of all. But not protect uh, Ukraine uh, against uh, Russian aggression. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 
uh, one of the uh, uh, reasons of on my, my mind uh, it was that uh, NATO position in the uh, Black Sea was not enough strong, uh, strong in, uh, in political military position was not strong in Black uh, Sea. I'm sorry. Uh, also, uh, China is an uh, important uh, uh, playhead in the uh, Black Aspen uh, region uh, because uh, uh, this region is the um, main transit uh, way uh, from. Uh, China to the uh, Euro and in uh, So the China is in provides a policy of one belt, one way uh, policy in this region. And the interest of uh, China and the uh, NATO uh, in these uh, regions uh, not uh, entered. So, uh, Unprotected future for policy reasons in Black Caspian Sea regions uh, uh, provide uh, stable unstability in the Black Sea region uh, and the Caspian Sea region too. Uh, also, for of uh, particular integration of uh, May zone, uh, it will be the uh, uh, main, uh, uh, main direction of uh, uh, world uh, leaders of this um, uh, in this region. Also, uh, protect uh, priorities of NATO Ukrainian party, uh, partnership for stabilization of situation in Black Sea, Caspian Sea regions uh, will be very important in the global future. So, the military strategic situation around Black Sea and Caspian Sea regions. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Speakers Stepan Yakimiat and Evgeny Zafritsky tell us some words about this situation. But yeah, uh, I am uh, trying to present concrete uh, to they um, of uh, his. Uh, cases. So, uh, Black Sea and Caspian Sea uh, region uh, was the traditional uh, corridor uh, uh, for Russian uh, uh, federation uh, for the uh, increasing role in the Mediterranean, uh, Black Sea. Uh, in the uh, other uh, uh, sea, before the full uh, scale aggression uh, will be, uh, uh, will be uh, both, I'm, I'm sorry, both, uh, only uh, now for several last years. Uh, so you can see 
uh, uh, like the uh, forces, male forces from uh, from uh, uh, North Fleet of Russian Federation from the Mediterranean uh, proceed uh, to the uh, Black Sea. Also, some uh, ships, warships from uh, Pacific Ocean Fleet from uh, uh, Suez Channel and also Asian Sea uh, proceed uh, to the Black Sea too. The tall uh, uh, Black Sea uh, uh, drawing uh, for of uh, uh, February last year was uh, thirty-five uh, ships, thirty-five ships, and the Mediterranean Sea was uh, eighteen ships. A lot of ships was in a uh, Sea of Azov too. On the Sea of Azov. As of uh, was uh, about twenty uh, warships, and the activities of um, Russian military activities at the uh, Sea of Azov, uh, you can see this on this uh, uh, slide. You, uh, uh, you can see. That it was the main test of uh, uh, worship of Black Sea Fleet of Caspian Flotilla as of was the goal of uh, Ukrainian seaports and the uh, naval base at the uh, sea was the bombing of um, shoot objects like the military uh, and the uh, civil objects too. Uh, and projection in uh, all shipping in uh, this region it was uh, in the beginning of the uh, Russian uh, armed aggression. Uh, in that time, in February and May, March uh, 2022, in the uh, northwest part of uh, Black Sea, uh, Russian ships uh, and the aircraft uh, uh, have a test block of uh, uh, Ukrainian shore, uh, Ukrainian coast. It was a capture of uh, uh, Zmiimi Island uh, and the rejection of uh, shipping uh, and the navigation in this area. Uh, uh, in uh, other places, in the um, uh, April and May 2022 was a uh, 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 projection uh, uh, power at sea uh, in uh, uh, the uh, west uh, uh, part of the Black Sea uh, was uh, a project uh, uh, military power, fear, power, maritime power. Uh, it was the broken and isolating of these uh, regions. And also, it was a strike on um, objects uh, of uh, Ukraine by missiles uh, uh, Liber. Liber. In this time, in the uh, black 
scheme was um, uh, uh, two frigates, uh, the eight uh, missiles caliber uh, uh, each, and uh, uh, three corvettes, uh, also um, uh, eight um, uh, missiles on board, and uh, also three uh, submarines, three submarines. Um, uh, were carry uh, four, uh, four missiles caliber. Everyone. Uh, also, you can see a situation which was <coughs> from uh, to June. Uh, and uh, till the uh, 1st August 2022. Uh, yesterday, Stefan uh, Ignat spoke about uh, the, the situation which was in this period of vaccines. Uh, and uh, after 1st August of uh, last uh, yeah, and uh, you uh, car uh, and uh, uh, basic fleet and other uh, formation of uh, Russian Federation, military formation, uh, 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 conduct uh, provide uh, military power at um, uh, Central and Eastern uh, part of uh, Black Sea and uh, 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 trying to return the power, uh, sorry, power, power authority uh, on the uh, north and uh, uh, west of the Black Sea. And, uh, uh, try to the uh, objects, uh, critical infrastructure objects uh, of uh, our country uh, by by uh, by missing out the leaders. Uh, also. Uh, Ukrainian forces uh, uh, provide the uh, initiative of um, shipping grain uh, uh, from Ukraine to the African, Asian, and European uh, seaports. Uh, so, uh, about some words about current tactics of the enemy and ever the black and the uh, 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 uh now you can see it, uh, this uh slide. also some words about the uh, Ukrainian uh, naval component uh, development. It's about forming uh, risk forming, uh, forming the new uh, subunion, uh, subunion in the uh, our uh, navy. It is. Uh, oh. And I really have to say that you have a few minutes left. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So. Uh, that's all. Uh, what is the question? Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Andre, for the situation report. What what comes around Ukraine? Is there any questions in the audience here? Okay. Thank you. I I really hope, Andre, that you and your 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 colleagues can join us during the panel 
just right after 11 o'clock. So be in touch with, the, with, with this channel. Okay? Okay. Thank okay. you. At 11 o'clock. Okay. So, and, and we have a short break, uh, uh, and we continue within, uh, let's say, five minutes with parallel sessions upstairs is, is the second one, and, and here we, we uh, and there is the societal aspects of, of the Ukraine crisis, and, and here we continue with external and future aspects. Thank you.
Okay. Okay, ladies, gentlemen, we continue our seminar, and, and I have the privilege to introduce PhD Dr. Ivan Klutz, research fellow at the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute. Uh, he has uh, graduated and, and defended his doctoral dissertation in, in University Tartu, Estonia, and he has also degrees from Glasgow University. Uh, he has studied also in Moscow and in Mexico City, and his special interests include Russian foreign policy and federal politics. Today we will hear uh, Russia's wartime military diplo diplomacy with the countries of the Global South drivers and implications. Uh, Ivan, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, thank you for that introduction and thank you for joining today. Um, I'm very uh, happy and very honored to be presenting my ongoing research to this distinguished audience. Um, this is part, this, is, this presentation is uh, in a way an offshoot of my ongoing research project at the ICDS. Um, it is a wider uh, project about Russia's wartime relations with the Global South, looking not only at military cooperation, but also at broader um, instances of how has trade and other um, political dynamics uh, changed uh, in the last year. So this only narrows down to military cooperation, which I called here uh, diplomacy, but it should actually be just uh, cooperation. Um, yeah, cooperation. And uh, so I want to just uh, start with one, one caveat, is that um, uh, I'm, I, I have no background in uh, kind of military science or uh, military, uh, so please bear with me if I, uh, you know, bear, bear with me in that sense. I will make sure to add as much value to our discussion, but I very much want to uh, receive feedback from you, criticism, uh, questions, commentaries, uh, uh, and, uh, and it, uh, I want to very much continue our discussion with you uh, on this subject. So uh, the, my, this presentation, as I mentioned, is an ongoing project. Um, so I want to offer really conclusions. Usually I like to start with some sort of takeaway or just jump straight to the conclusions, but this time I'll have to just highlight that uh, everything that I mentioned will be pretty much preliminary and I will only offer a kind of closing reflection and some sort of hypothesis uh, instead of a conclusion. Uh, perhaps the takeaway that I want to highlight at the very start is that uh, uh, yesterday we spoke about potential surprises that uh, can still lurk uh, uh, in this year, that how can Russia still surprise us? And I think uh, some surprises can come indeed in the large part of the world that we call the uh, the Global South. Um, so here I start with international military cooperation. Um, just very briefly, uh, international two or more states, military, involve a military partner. Uh, it can also involve private uh, entities or let's say proxy entities like Wagner, uh, private military company uh, whose links to the Russian government are frequently um, interrogated. As we know, they receive uh, logistical support, and, but th that's something we can talk about maybe later. Um, cooperation, here uh, I would just distinguish between institutional cooperation and behavioral cooperation. Uh, this is a distinction that uh, I found in the literature. Institutional meaning, uh, let's say in few words, just the formal instances of cooperation, signing of agreements, uh, formal alliances, um, you know, that, 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 that level. Um, and behavioral is actual uh, actions, uh, uh, instances of, ac uh, of training mission, joint military exercise, joint operations, transfers, um, actual means, materials, and people um, actual, actually moving and crossing borders and uh, 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 adding 
and adding value beyond just the formal and symbolic element of uh, institutional cooperation. Um, and ultimately, military cooperation is a uh, strategic behavior. And I think uh, with the case of Russia and the global south, that strategic element becomes um, more or less tangible. Or I hope, I hope it becomes tangible by the end of this uh, presentation. Um, I, 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 in this presentation, I kind of allude in a way superficially to the idea of grand strategy and great powers. Um, great power, I think, uh, for me, what's important is to highlight that we can break down what it means to be a great power in terms of capability, behavior, and recognition. Capability meaning to have the actual means to um, assert some sort of global presence, one pr uh, presence that has some implications and some uh, weight to actually um, have, have a, a actual influence uh, beyond just, uh, again, rhetoric or uh, symbolic uh, actions. Uh, behavior, uh, it, in, in this case, it, uh, it refers to also cre uh, creating institutions and actually taking on certain responsibilities that are usually associated with great power status, um, which uh, Onia, in, uh, that I allude here uh, on the slide, refers to as kind of, um, uh, let's say, maintain, maintenance of uh, or administrative tasks of the international system. Um, and recognition, and this is, uh, in, I think, almost self-evident, the acknowledgement of a, of a certain country as a great power, uh, uh, a kind of a def def deference to, to the kind of a larger status than, than uh, assigned to other uh, countries. Uh, grand strategy, I think, uh, here we can go back to uh, just... Uh, uh, definition, little heart, um, national policy gui guiding all aspects of social and economic activity toward the achievement of war aims. Uh, of course, kind of the literature has um, distanced itself a bit from the idea that it, that it must be narrowly understood in the framework of war, or in the context of war. And so, of course, I take that uh, a bit wider understanding um, of itself. Grand Saturday is already very wide. Um, and the Russian case, I think, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's been a case that has already been looked at uh, both from the framework of grand strategy and as a great power. Um, the, its goal in the last 20 years of reviving, as a, uh, gaining back a great power status, affirming that status of building that capability, acquiring that kind of re engaging in that behavior, at, uh, especially in, um, in what it sees, in what Russia sees as. Uh, its uh, neighborhood and uh, gaining that recognition. Um, the means are well known. Uh, energy trade, especially in certain niche, uh, spe important areas, uh, a militarized foreign policy, hybrid war, and just uh, war outright. Um, it's been identified that in the year 2000 to 2007, more or less, uh, Russia under Vladimir Putin already tried to arrest the decline of, of Russia after the uh, fall of the Soviet Union and the um, continuous economic uh, decline that, uh, uh, and, de and decline in uh, military capabilities that, that uh, came with that. Uh, 2007 is usually taken as a symbolic date when uh, there was a shift in policy, uh, thinking in particular about the Munich Security Conference speech of Vladimir Putin, where, where he kind of um, articulated a, a confrontational vision on, in relations to, to the West, to the United States, to Europe. Um, and we can say that that was kind of a turning point um, from, for a period that we are still in, uh, to openly, Russia openly confronting the West. Now, uh, Russian grand strategy on the global south, uh, I want to just say two words about what I mean by global south. It's a very kind of frustrating notion because global, uh, you imagine a globe, but then south, the south of the globe, it's kind of a, it's not really a globe, but you imagine it as a semi-sphere anyway. Um, so I, I, I won't offer a, a, a definition. It's just uh, not the West and not Russia and uh, uh, successor states uh, or, or, or of the Soviet Union. 
Um, here I highlight in light blue and, and China, of course, uh, because I think China also deserves kind of particular treatment when it comes to its relationship with uh, Russia. Um, dark blue are Dark blue are, are those countries that Russia has signed a cooperation agreement, military cooperation agreement since 2014. Light blue are those that don't really fall into my understanding of Global South um, here. And I think here we see those elements that uh, connect Russia's approach uh, to the Global South with uh, on, an understanding of what it what means to be a great power. There's a kind of global reach, uh, of power projection, um, every continent is included here. Um, there's a military presence in every continent, continent as well. Uh, of course, kind of signing an agreement doesn't mean a lot if there's no, no, uh, no actual uh, activities uh, uh, in, in happening in the framework of that agreement. Um, as I mentioned, there's the, f the formal military cooperation uh, and the behavioral. Uh, but I think we can point to very concrete cases of behavioral military cooperation in every every continent and in uh, very many of these uh, countries in dark blue. Um, and the element of recognition is the global scale of the ambition. Uh, of course, P5 member, uh, second largest diplomatic network, and uh, very wide and very broad uh, uh, geographic scope of uh, institutional military cooperation. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the time frame is uh, uh, roughly until uh, the end of uh, 2022, simply to limit the scale of da uh, data collection. Uh, and I look at, uh, uh, I, I try to look at as many, um, I, I try to collect all the known reported uh, instances of military cooperation, both institutional and behavioral. Now, uh, of course, Russia is a, kind of reliable information on these topics can be hard to get when it comes to Russia, needless to say. Uh, they report themselves many things. Many things are accessible online, but uh, then, but there are things that we learn later on, um, and I will actually explain what I mean by that uh, a bit more. Um, um, here I highlight Eswatini, um, because uh, the kingdom had a, a training mission was sending officers to Russia to train there for uh, a couple of years, but then once the full-scale invasion uh, began, they actually left the country. And uh, that, that, uh, that's, that to me, I just wanted to point that out as an example of how this uh, military cooperation became also interrupted. It's not only expansion, expansion, but also some uh, cutting down. Um, now, uh, since this is an ongoing project, uh, I, I don't have all the instances, so I cannot offer that uh, quantitative uh, approach that would be quite insightful. So I just want to highlight four case studies, Iran, Myanmar, North Korea, and Venezuela. Uh, four very different countries in different parts of the world, uh, different uh, continents, uh, and different types of uh, regime, different types of uh, uh, relationship with Russia, but generally kind of close relationship with Russia at uh, uh, leadership level at least. Um, and for countries that have not condemned the war and have been uh, in some cases even expressed uh, very similar views to Russia, we can speculate for what reason they've taken such a position, but uh, uh, that position is uh, well recorded. And I will speak a bit more why this comparison, but uh, I think I will just move on to to, to this. Uh, I, I, don't, I won't go too deep into Iran and Russia because we already heard from uh, the, the keynote pr uh, presentation today that uh, cooperation between the two countries uh, has expanded uh, since the start of the full-scale war. Um, the relationship has had up and down since uh, 1979. Uh, it's only fairly recent, relatively recent, let's say, that uh, they uh, have coincided so, uh, that they have converged so closely when it comes to their views on international relations, on international affairs, and on international, um, well, international security would not be really adequate because, you, you, you see what I mean. Um, 
they have a broad partnership across the Middle East, uh, especially in Syria. So uh, th this has been a relationship that has been gaining scope um, and, of, uh, and has been more, most recently actualized in the shape of uh, large arms transfer, industrial cooperation on drones, but uh, not only. Now, uh, a more uh, obscure case in that sense is the military cooperation between Russia and Myanmar. Uh, and it's an interesting case because unlike other instances of uh, Russia Global South interactions, Myanmar was not a Cold War partner, so there was no uh, institutional legacy building up from uh, the 20th century. It's relatively recently built, uh, and it's a, a rapport, let's say, built between the uh, military leadership of, uh, of, of the country, even during the time of civilian government. And now under the junta, it's, uh, Russia has turned out to be one of the very few countries willing to uh, uh, engage Myanmar at all. Um, one thing to emphasize here is that there's a, a symmetry in relations. Um, in a sense, uh, Myanmar anchors Russia's presence in a ASEAN, but uh, so it, Myanmar is important for Russia in that sense. But I, 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 I would argue that Russia is more important for uh, uh, Myanmar, or at the very least for the junta, than the junta is important for Russia. So there's a, a symmetry. Um, the, the best known instance of, kind of publicly known instance of uh, military cooperation is this uh, committee on uh, so-called anti-terrorism, which in the context of, my, of Myanmar, uh, we, we don't exactly know what, uh, we know kind of from press releases, but uh, it's hard to make out what, how, how has this uh, anti, so-called anti-terrorism cooperation, how it has been actually operationalized on the ground. Um, we can, we can speculate what that means in the context of uh, uh, the Myanmar civil war, and especially in the context of Russia's attitudes to uh, conflict management, uh, kind of relying on coercion, relying on authoritarian consolidation, relying on uh, uh, kind of br really brutality, in, in the, the, uh, strategically deployed uh, brutality against uh, civilian populations especially. Now, North Korea, Russia, uh, it's a, I think, I think what I mentioned at, at the start that this is a kind of challenging topic to address precisely because of the lack of transparency. And I think Russia-North Korea relations uh, really uh, uh, illustrate that. Uh, or two very close regimes, uh, a very close Cold War partnership, but uh, that kind of collapsed uh, uh, with the Soviet Union and only gradually rebuilt as Russia became um, more confrontational with the West, and there was closer and closer convergence on the US, on sanctions, on the, uh, and especially on this shared anti-democratic perspective. Both uh, regimes now, nowadays converge on a worldview against, uh, that is kind of a worldview that sees democracy as uh, threatening um, for regime security, but also for just uh, security uh, broadly understood, um, equating kind of uh, democracy with uh, disorder and uh, pop, uh, revolution and uh, uh, Western influence uh, and interference. Um, the, we, we don't know uh, exactly, of course, what is the shape of, the war, of this wartime uh, military cooperation, but we know, or it's been alleged rather by uh, intelligence agencies and the US government in particular that uh, this uh, but the fright that resumed in 2022, it was closed down due to COVID, it resumed uh, last year, and it was for uh, an exchange of uh, kind of food and other kind of essential supplies sent from Russia to North Korea, and then North Korea gave back in exchange uh, their kind of uh, the, uh, surplus uh, Soviet era, uh, kind of Soviet era, uh, Soviet model um, uh, uh, military supplies. With Venezuela and Russia, it's uh, also an interesting case, I think, uh, because there's been many, in it's, it's known that there's are two military partners and there, um, for, for many years, uh, there was the flight of those uh, strategic bombers one, once in a while uh, to Venezuela, more for show than actual um, um, 
kind of uh, posture, but still a uh, de demonstration that Russia has that global reach, and also, so in a way, also essential for Russia's great power um, ambitions, let's say. Um, Russia, uh, Venezuela is a key anchor for uh, Russia in Latin America, but there's also that asymmetry in the relationship because uh, unlike North Korea or Iran, Venezuela is highly indebt indebted to, to, to Russia. Uh, and relations in 2022, there was speculation that Washington would try to uh, dislodge Venezuela from Russia. Uh, and there were some hints that there was uh, indeed some change in the relationship between the Venezuela and Russia. But uh, uh, my, my assessment is that uh, other than this, that, that Venezuela has gained a bit more scope in their relationship, but not really leverage. And that Caracas would not like to uh, give up their partnership with Russia uh, in exchange of really anything that uh, is currently on the table with uh, uh, the US and the West. Uh, there was a, the one kind of concrete instance of military co cooperation uh, in last year was the joint military exercise in August that interestingly, hap interestingly happened together with Iran. So there's uh, kind of an interesting triangle there uh, in military affairs. So uh, here, here we have all, uh, all four cases side by side. Um, and I think this table um, uh, shows a bit better why I, wanted, why I chose these four cases to present to you today. Um, four countries under international sanctions, five with Russia, uh, five countries not considered free or democratic, uh, five countries that have very low uh, this global peace index because what I, I chose this metric uh, uh, this peace index because uh, it's uh, it's hard to say that any of these five countries are at peace uh, with Russia is kind of self-evident uh, North Korea is not at war but it's a highly militarized society that is uh, on war footing uh, essentially uh, constantly uh, Iran is similarly uh, especially uh, last year with the large-scale protests and their large-scale uh, repression. Uh, Venezuela is kind of interesting because it has, it's actually, according to this uh, Global Militarization Index, it's, it's actually not a very militarized society. Um, but if you break it down, it uh, actually has uh, very large mil uh, armed forces. They're just uh, not so well equipped. Um, and despite the fact that Venezuela is not fighting any war, it, it, there's, it's also a, a matter of... Uh, uh, repression against civilian population and uh, uh, kind of conflictive relationship with Colombia. And this is kind of w one element here that, now why, why I, I chose these four cases? Because I think they illustrate well four, uh, two different types of relationship between Russia and, and countries of the global south. And those are relationship where there is some sort of symmetry and relationship where there is some sort of asymmetry. And I highlight here as partnership type Partner is where there's symmetry, um, and uh, a client where there is asymmetry. Where um, partner is where there, where uh, it can't be said that Russia depends on the other country and vice versa. Whereas uh, in the case of Myanmar and Venezuela, I would argue uh, they need Russia way more than uh, Russia needs them. And uh, in these cases, there's the, it coincides. With, uh, with the fact that uh, Iran and North Korea, they, the, the military cooperation was operationalized last year in the shape of arms transfers, uh, whereas with Myanmar and Venezuela, it's uh, in this kind of nebulous, hard to pin down, uh, perhaps mostly symbolic instances of uh, 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 partnership, of joint military exercise and counter-terrorism uh, in this diffuse manner. I'm, I'm near the end, and I, in fact, this is the last uh, slide. Um, and just what to, what, to, what to take away from this comparison? I, I, I mentioned that there's no, no conclusion because this is still ongoing, but I do want to leave with some, uh, I, want to, I want you to leave with some takeaways. Um, first, that despite uh, Russia's being, Russia being focused uh, on, on Ukraine and, and uh, uh, on the West, uh, regime, Russia still is invested in protecting uh, those countries that, um, those regimes, uh, 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 especially um, that have uh, 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 agreed to, to, uh, 
to lend their countries as uh, uh, vectors for Russia to project influence beyond, uh, uh, especially beyond Eurasia. Uh, the case of Venezuela, I think, is clear. Uh, ASEAN, uh, um, Myanmar, as I mentioned, kind of uh, gives R Russia some more scope nowadays in ASEAN. Um, but then I think what, what's become new is that uh, those Russian partners with, with whom Moscow has some sort of symmetrical relationship, they've become more important. But what actually leads to a, a, a effective cooperation, I think, is a, a matter of compatibility. In the case of North Korea, I mentioned some sort of industrial compatibility when it comes to uh, Soviet era models of, of defense systems, but also opportunity. And I think Iran, despite the fact that there's no compatibility in, in the same way as North Korea, there is uh, 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 kind of con 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 confluence of interests uh, uh, and uh, op opportunity in that sense. And instead of a conclusion, I, I present the kind of hypothesis that uh, perhaps what we're witnessing in the short term is uh, retrenchment um, because of Russia's declining military and uh, also economic prospects. Um, it now, when it comes to the global south, it needs to rest restore its credibility, uh, restore its capability, I mean, but also reassure its uh, partners that it will maintain its presence. Um, and I hope that the cases I've shown today, they kind of hint that why invest in, uh, uh, in this military, ex military uh, exercise with Venezuela or with uh, uh, Myanmar, this uh, uh, counter supposed counter-terrorism uh, 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 um, dialogue, it, uh, it has to do also with reassuring of a continued presence. But despite the large needs that uh, Russia's invasion that, that Russia has due to its uh, uh, aggression against Ukraine, uh, there's uh, limited expansion uh, in its relations with the global south uh, when it comes to military uh, cooperation. Uh, Iran and North Korea are uh, cases where there was kind of opportunity and, and compatibility, but uh, uh, when we see Venezuela, for instance, it would be, one would think that there would be an opportunity for Russia to have a surprise, to surprise the United States from there and kind of bring the wider confrontation with the West to the Western Hemisphere, but uh, that has not been the case, at least in uh, this past year. Uh, like I mentioned at the start, maybe uh, there are surprises ahead. So. Thank you very much. I look forward to all your comments and questions. Thank you very much. I think we will take the next presentation from Kiva and then we continue the discussion in the panel. Hello, Nina Andrianova. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I hear you. I need money. <laughs> I suppose it was yes. Yes, yes, yes thank you. Okay. So the next presentation we will be hearing from Kiev from the Center for Military and Strategic Studies in the National Defense University of Ukraine. And uh, I think Lieutenant Colonel Nina Andrianova, she's leading researcher in this university and, and, and mainly uh, interest is the and transformation of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, research of the integration processes and the international cooperation. And but but uh, so I heard that that this presentation is, is compiled with uh, Colonel Andriy Ivashenko and Valery Hardichuk together. So and and I give the floor to Nina, please.
Excuse me. Uh, hello, everyone. We are happy to meet you from here. Thank you for your attention. We are three hours. As you said, Colonel uh, Levice, the Colonel Petichuk, uh, and me, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Andrianova. Uh, so let's start. Our topic is countering the Russian invasion strategy in Ukraine, conceptions and capabilities. You hear me? Uh, since the beginning of Russia large-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, the armed forces of Ukraine have successfully defended and pushed back Russian forces in many regions, despite a number of obvious challenges. To date, uh, the armed forces of Ukraine have demonstrated considerable flexibility during the conflict, the ability to integrate Western security assistance and training into their military operations. Uh, the defense forces of Ukraine continue to restrain the pressure of the Russian troops to resistance, the resistance that are combined by significant losses of Ukraine in personnel and equipment. Both sides face the risk of the winter period. Russia's large-scale aggression against Ukraine doesn't fit into the concept of uh, a medium-intensity local conflict in terms of duration, spatial indicators, the number of military forces, the list of weapons, and other high-tech equipment involved in the conflict. Uh, therefore, by all indicator indications, uh, this conflict can be identified as undeclared war. Therefore, for today, the defense forces of Ukraine operate on 2,500 kilometers front from Kherson to Kovel. Tens of thousand pieces of military equipment are involved in the conflict. More than a million people who directly or indirectly participate in this war with weapons in their hands. On the part of Russia, up to 1,500 launches of high pressure cross missiles of type uh, Iskander, Kaliber, Hal 101, or 555 are executed. On average, it is up to 200 rockets every month. Some forces of Russia spend up to uh, 550 to 60,000 artillery rockets and shells every single day. The following principles are the basis of the Russia uh, aggressive strategy of the Russian Federation, such as the, uh, directed at the destruction of the state, which was unable to adequately counter the Russian troops. Impunity, which in the political plane is determined by weak political will and in such insufficient consolidation of the countries participating in military political blocs and in the military plan by the territorial dislocation of decision-making centers and important strategic objects outside the zone of actions of Ukrainian weapons. A uh, long active phase of combat action based on significant resources, widely test used of proxies forces, creeping militarization of a Russian consciousness. The goal of, of the Russian strategy remains to maintain control over the temporarily occupied territory of Autonomous Republic of Crimea and get access to the administrative border to the Donetsk region. Plans to advance deeply into the territory of Ukraine in the direction of Krivi and Zaporizhia are being considered. Not exclusively not excluded uh, from the agenda is the return to plans to capture Kiev and redeploy forces from the territory of Republic of Belarus. The aggressor country uses such methods of hybrid warfare as hiding the goals of aggression, destruction of energy infrastructure facilities of Ukraine, denial of strikes on civilian objects, destruction of hospitals, residential buildings, terror against the civilian population, and transferring responsibility for the global food crisis to Ukraine. It is predicted that hybrid warfare will continue beyond 2023. 
it is possible to talk only about a new stage of confrontation. Of course, with different initial data and perspectives, but it will be an ongoing conflict, heavy casualties, cost of resources, and unsettled end result. Thus, despite the massive use of conventional weapons by the Russian armed forces, Russia's aggressive strategy against Ukraine contains all the signs of hybrid war, which is characterized by increase the number of spaces and operational domains of combat operation. In addition to the tradi traditional operation domains of physical sphere, as you can see on slide, land, maritime, air, space, operational domains of virtual space, cyber, and informational. informational. Countering Russian aggression continues in new dimensions, such as uh, the previously unstated cognitive domain. It has particular importance in the context of conducting combat actions on one's territory for the occupation operations. The confrontation in the cognitive dimension is a form of unconventional war, battle for hearts and minds of people. The specific objectives of influence are subordinated to the general strategy of the occupation. The cognitive sphere is related to the activities of various subjects, including, including national resistance, reflexive management, strategic communications, public relations, interagency coordination, civil military interaction. This area is largely concerned with the social impact of disinformation, uh, cyber and electronic warfare. Uh, the technologies of confrontation in the cognitive dimension are developing in close connection with the technologies of di digitalization, artificial intelligence analysis and big data processing. The combination of this technology allows to control influence on communities and in individuals to change their cognitive frames and behavior, including influence on political and military decision-making procedures. At the same time, the growing importance of the cognitive dimension gives rise to a wide range of research questions. The prospect of the military campaign to liberate the occupied territories of Ukraine and further ensure the military security of Ukraine are considered uh, taking into account such a complex and ambiguous combination of factors of Russia aggression in many areas. Only their full and comprehensive consideration, the achievement of synergetic effects at the intersection of domains uh, will create the precondition uh, preconditions for the victory of Ukraine and the end of the destructive war in Europe. Ukrainian army should constantly evolve and transform the way we think, equip, educate, training, organize and prepare for cooperation, competition and to be ready to resist aggression. To achieve this, the armed forces of Ukraine are adapting doctrine, organization, and training to create a fighting force capable to counter in Russian great power aggression through operation in multiple areas. In the operational domains of physical space, the only way to counter Russian aggression is to launch several successive, optimally simul simultaneous counterattack during the 2023 campaign. At the same time, the issue of their planning and implementation requires an additional number of missiles, ammunition, artillery systems, missile systems, electronic warfare equipment, as well as uh, the use of new approaches to countermeasures and the occupation of the territory of Ukraine. New strategic approaches much take into account both innovation innovations and modernizations developed by military specialists and the, of the leading countries of the world, as well as features in, inherent in the current high intensity conflict. The main feature of countering Russia aggressive strategy is non-significant difference in the number of forces of the parties in favor of the Russians, as you can see on the slide. And non-significant special indicators of the strategic operation against Ukraine. The disparity in capabilities is decisive. It is most revealing embodiment 
is the difference in the ultimate reach of high precision weapons. If for armed forces of Russia Federation, it is up to 2,000 kilometers, taking into, into account the flight range of A-based cross missiles, then for the armed forces of Ukraine, it is actually limited to just 100 kilometers by the fly range of missiles, <clears throat> sorry, and the depth of the local of the starting position of outdated operation tactical missile system. Uh, thus, uh, since the beginning of the large scale aggression, the means of defeat of some forces of Ukraine have a range almost 20 times smaller than that of the enemy. It is necessary to ensure the ability to, to act symmetrically and at a similar range. This requires a supply by Ukraine, Ukraine's partners to the Defense Forces of Ukraine of weapon system and certain types of ammunition with appropriate range. A comprehensive approach to the equipment of artillery, missile forces, Tactical aviation, the naval forces of the armed forces of Ukraine and other components of defense forces must be applied. It is necessary to equip and re-equip the armed forces of Ukraine with weapon system and of the appropriate range with proper long-term vision. In order to support the joint forces, it is necessary to have constant interaction between the domains while preserving their full freedom of action, the ability to flexible system of capacity building and constant maneuvers. A multi-domain operation is not only simple coordination of the actions of the ground forces, aviation, Navy, and other components of the defense forces, but the creation of such capabilities that would allow, if necessary, the ground forces to fully use the capabilities of special operations forces, marines, aviation, cyber forces, etc. The concept of multi-domain uh, domain operations is based on autonomous interaction, unit-unit, by passing the virtual unit headquarters operation. But uh, by passing the joint headquarters, we inevitably face to the factor of blurring the operation into individual combat operations. To avoid this, a reliable automated control and defeat system is needed. Such a system provides uh, for the unification of all means of control, communication, intelligence, and information processing in a single network for the purpose of conducting multi-domain operations. Today, the elements of such a system can be uh, confidently attributed to the combat-proven automatic tacti tactical management systems. The informational system such as ARTA, Kerpiva, and the Starlink satellite system. Automated command and control system ARTA has been used by the armed forces of Ukraine since, since 2014 and has shown high efficiency compared to traditional approach to management and control. It is mostly used in artillery units because of the specifics of planning and conducting combat actions, the requirements for factual data and the urgency for obtaining information about the results and combat actions. At the same time, uh, ARTA has proven itself as a good tool for situational and control centers and expectational uh, tool for planning, monitoring, uh, pr processing, and spreading the result of intelligence uh, operations. Starlink allows to create a unique strategic advantage over the enemy and creates new opportunity for control and communication in a multi-domain operation. In our opinion, Starlink technology is suitable as one of the informational exchange systems in multi-domain operation, primarily at the operational and tactical levels. According to the assessment of our strategic partner, partners, the Ukrainian armed forces continue to demonstrate high level of operational flexibility, motivation, and capability. The Ukrainian armed forces command structure appears to be more centralized as opposite to the more local localized command structure exhibited earlier in the war. 
Nevertheless, the Ukrainian Armed Forces Command has demonstrated flexibility and readiness to adjust operations due to changing circumstances, particularly at the unit level. It also appears the Ukrainian Armed Forces continues to adopt NATO-style principles of command, such as the delegation of authority of local commands, as well as to junior and lower level officers. To summarize all of about implementation of the concept of multi-domain operation is proposed in the following directions. Organizing the deployment uh, of addi additional joint forces, attracting the potential of allies, mm -hmm. preventing uh, the enemy from the using the method of hybrid warfare, inflicting a quick defeat of the armed forces of Russia. Introduction of method of using in inter-services groups of troops, forces which include new type units capable of operating separately from the main forces for a long time. Concentration of military and political efforts at crucial moments of time on the main directions, that is creation of windows of opportunity for the maneuver of group of troops and identify a, a set of favorable conditions, factors, and weaknesses that allow to gain an advantage over the enemy in various operational environments in order to capture, hold, and use the initiative for further defeating it. The implementation of the concept of multi-domain operation is a complex uh, problem that the armed forces of Ukraine still need to overcome taking into account both uh, their own combat experience and the best practice of other countries. So thank you for your attention. We're ready to answer your questions. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Nina. I, I think we have a time for, for one or two questions from the audience if before the next presentation. Nina, uh, thank you very much for presenting today. Uh, this is uh, John Neal. I'm represent the U.S. European Command's Russia Strategic Initiative. Uh, the question I have is, the, with the influx of uh, further Western materials um, into the Ukrainian military and the, the sporadic way that that will be introduced, what is the Ukraine military's approach to be able to organize this equipment and, and the diversity of equipment into effective fighting formations. Thank you. Could you hear the question? Uh, thank you for the question. Repeat it because uh, hard to hear. It Could you repeat your question? Nina, can you hear me? Yes, I hear. How does the Ukrainian military plan to organize and receive and train on the new equipment that's being provided from the West uh, in order to be able to provide uh, coherent units uh, to be able to affect your strategy. Over.
Can you hear us? Could we, you, you, did, it, did you get the question? Did you get the question or should we repeat it once more? Disappeared. Excuse me, very bad technical uh, connection. Uh, it's really hard to hear. Too noise. Uh, okay, we try once more. Nina, uh, can you hear me? Nina, can you hear me? Yeah, you. Okay, I'll I'll be brief. How will the Ukrainian military intake the diverse amount of Western weapons that are coming in periodically in order to get the best effect from those systems? No, it's the brakes are, are, are there. So I, I think we continue. We continue with our our, our seminar, uh, and and please, Nina, could you please stay online? We will be shortly begin our panel discussion. We try the connection once more there. I have the privilege to introduce our next two speakers from Britain. Uh, Dr. Mark Devore, he's the senior lecturer at the University of St. Andrews. He co-chairs the Ukrainian working group uh, whose members include academics and retired high-level military personnel from across the United Kingdom and, and USA. He's currently a British Academy Fellow and advises the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office on technical sanctions targeting uh, Russia's defence industries. Dr. Kristen Harkness is also Senior Lecturer at the University of St Andrews. She is the director of the university's Institute for the Study of War and Strategy. He is also, she is also an uh, Economic and, and Social Research Council Fellow and Research Lead for the House of Commons for Defence and Security Issues. And we will hear 
a presentation, Prolonged Wars in the 21st Century. Please. Thank you so much, Penty. Um, so let me first start out by saying that everything that we say here is wearing our hats as faculty members at the University of St. Andrews and does not in any way implicate the FCDO or uh, the Houses of Parliament and their associated um, aspects. So anything idiotic that we say, purely us. Um, I would also like to say that in our talk, we have a third co-author, Teres Pirirko, uh, who is a Ukrainian so social anthropologist based at Glasgow University, who's provided a lot of the rich empirical research that we're dealing with on uh, battlefield innovation or battlefield adaptation in Ukraine. And the basic topic that we're looking at is how do militaries adapt, and particularly how has the Ukrainian military adapted to the challenges of the current war? And this issue of battlefield adaptation is both old and it's new. There's been a long debate, uh, a long scholarly debate, about how do militaries adapt once they end up in combat. As I'm sure all of you are aware of the elder von Moltke's quote, the best plans collapse at the first contact with the enemy. And therefore, armies often find themselves wrong-footed or faced with surprises when wars actually break out. So therefore, once a conflict occurs, what's critical for military effectiveness is how does a military respond, learn lessons, and apply those lessons in improving its performance during the course of a war? Now, a lot of the scholarly literature on battlefield adaptation focuses on counterinsurgencies. And that's because the only long wars that the world's great military powers have fought since the 1950s have been against insurgents. So we have very rich studies of American, British adaptation in Afghanistan and Iraq, adaptation and the failures of adaptation during the, the Vietnam War, some studies of Russian adaptation and weaknesses of adaptation in Chechnya. But basically that literature is focusing on prolonged counterinsurgencies. There's something of an older literature focusing on how militaries adapted and failed to adapt to the challenges of the world wars, but we don't really have any contemporary studies about how do militaries adapt to the challenges of prolonged conventional intense warfare today. And the reason for that's relatively easy to see. Wars have either been prolonged counterinsurgencies or wars have, since 1950 have been relatively short conventional wars. So if we think of most conventional wars prior to this current war, they lasted at most two or three months. The 1973 Arab-Israeli War, which for a long period of time was scrutinized by American and NATO policymakers for lessons, was 19 days. The first Gulf War, 1991, which was considered something worthy of study and a sort of great case study, 42 days. The Falklands War, Britain has just celebrated the 40th anniversary of the Falklands War, pivotal event in modern British history, 72 days. The Kosovo Air War, you know, Pivotal event for NATO, 78 days. In some ways, the most prolonged recent conflict between two major states 
was the 84 days of uh, the cargo war between India and Pakistan in 1998. Yeah. So since 1950, the overwhelming majority of high-intensity conventional wars have been extraordinarily short, such that very little scope occurred during the war for actual learning to occur. Now, there's two exceptions. One of those is the Iran-Iraq War, and the other one is the Ethiopia-Eritrea War of 1998-1999. But because those are both, those occurred between militaries that were not considered in the top tier of world militaries and also relatively closed societies, we don't really know that much about how they adapted to the challenges they faced on those battlefields. So in some ways, what we are seeing today in the Russo-Ukrainian War is the first prolonged high-intensity war since the 1950s, and therefore the first war where we can really study how do significant militaries adapt or fail to adapt when they're faced with novel battlefield circumstances. And this is also the first war where this issue of battlefield adaptation during a high in, in a high intensity environment is posed in a digital society, in societies where everybody has smartphones, where Wi-Fi is widely available, and where social media can serve as a connective organism. So in that perspective, this issue of battlefield adaptation is both feeding into an existing scholarly debate, but we have a fundamentally new case and a more important case, arguably, from anything that's happened in the recent past to try to figure out how in the 21st century do digital, highly networked societies adapt or fail to adapt on the battlefield. So I will hand over to Kristen to tell us more about that literature. Okay, so when we, when we talk about military learning, about military adaptation, um, we're talking about something a, a bit more specific than you, than you might think at first. So all militaries, right, in the course of battle, in the course of fighting wars, they're going to have individuals, they're going to have units that try new things, that experiment, that find that things don't work, that have to jerry-rig equipment in the field. When we talk about military learning and adaptation, we're really talking at the organizational level. Is the military as an organization picking up these lessons or learning how to do new things and systematizing that? So, so it has to go a bit beyond just we've tried something new or we're seeing somebody do something a bit different um, in the field. And so we tend to talk about, or the literature talks about, uh, four mechanisms by which this more systematic learning occurs. And usually uh, we want to see that, that the learning is spreading across units, at least those relevant units. So you wouldn't necessarily expect um, all adaptations or all learning to, to go to a unit where it doesn't make sense, right? That in a, you know, adaptations in parachuting are not going to translate to the Navy. So, so you're looking at the units where it makes sense. So we think about these four different types of mechanisms, only three of which uh, I think occur fairly regularly. The first is top-down learning. That means that an idea or an innovation or an adaptation comes from the top of the hierarchy, and it's diffused downward, usually through the command structure, through a lessons learned process. Um, the important thing is that that innovation or adaptation, it originates at the top, and there's a top-down process of change. Uh, the second mechanism is a bottom-up one. That's where the ideas are coming from frontline units, from soldiers in the field. Um, and then they're, they're filtering up the command hierarchy through some kind of lessons learned process and then diffusing out. But, it, but the command hierarchy is still central to that and it's usually doing the processing of the lessons learned and then bringing it to other units. 
There are other scholars who talk about a horizontal learning process between frontline units that doesn't involve the command hierarchy, where a unit, one unit, learns something and then it's able to communicate that to a neighboring unit. So we, we see this talked about in the context of the First World War quite a bit, is that units that were stationed next to each other in the trenches, that learning would diffuse along the line. Right? One unit would learn from the neighboring unit that would learn from the neighboring unit. So you didn't necessarily need the command hierarchy involved um, to get the spread or the diffusion of ideas and the routinization of those practices. And then some people talk about a mechanism of learning which they call either individualistic or liberal, not sure why they termed it that, but this is a person to person learning, right? That the that that whatever is going on is being transmitted from individual to individual, rather unit to unit. And one example that's sometimes given or that I've heard given is in motor pools. So in Iraq, in Afghanistan, um, uh, that, you know, units would come back from, from field assignments, from going out. Uh, something would happen to the equipment, right? They'd have to jerry-rig uh, a solution in the field. Then the mechanics or, you know, the soldiers would come back to the motor pool unit, and over a cup of coffee, they'd share that practice with um, technicians from other units. And then, then those sorts of solutions would spread across units that way. So that, those are the models we have out there about how learning occurs. Um, it's either coming from the top and diffusing downward, it's coming from the bottom and coming up the command hierarchy, or it's moving right from unit to unit across the field. Um, and again, uh, as Mark said, right, all, all of this theorization and all of these models are coming out of a, actually a very narrow set of case studies. The world wars, um, and then some contemporary long counterinsurgency campaigns, Iraq and Afghanistan primarily, and the US and the UK experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan. There are some other case studies occasionally thrown in there, but, but we have a quite um, narrow range of experiences uh, that this literature is based on. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is figure out what's going on right now. So how is the Ukrainian military learning? We focused on the Ukrainian military in large part because that's where we can get good information. Uh, we don't have good information or we don't think we have good information right now on the Russian military. Um, we have better contacts, right? The West and our governments were working very closely with the Ukrainians. There, uh, there's a lot of public information out there. Um, and our co-author has con a lot of contact on the ground to get high quality information out of interviews, out of observation. Um, so we're focusing on the Ukrainian military for now. That's not to say the Russian military isn't learning and adapting too. Um, and so there, there's quite a bit going on. Uh, I, we think that the Ukrainian military is actually being uh, exhibiting a lot of signs of being a learning organization and being quite good at learning. Um, and so I'm going to flip back over to Mark to, to sort of talk about how we're seeing and interpreting the learning that's going on and classifying it. Thanks, Kristen. So as we started to look at learning and trying to apply this typology to it, what we discovered is that we could see evidence for various types of learning within the Ukrainian military. One could see cases of top-down learning. Uh, we classified the modification of the Tupolev 141 uh, Cold War era drones for long-range strike as likely in that process. That was a high-level decision that in the absence of Western long-range strike capabilities, they were going to modify existing kit, task engineers with the process, did so, and then we saw the relatively spectacular strikes on uh, Engel Air Airfield and other facilities. Um, getting back in some ways to John's question beforehand, General Zaluzhny's initiative of trying to create 10 to 20 combined arms brigades for offensive operations is in a way, whether it succeeds or not, is an attempt at top-down innovation, uh, top-down uh, adaptation, as have been the various efforts to amalgamate Home Guard 
uh, and various militia type units into more regular formations. So we see a fair amount of top-down adaptation. We also see bottom-up innovation. In some ways, the, what seems to have been the relatively unplanned and spontaneous adaptation to tunnel warfare in Mariupol once those units were cut off is a very good case of bottom-up innovation. Local level commanders seeing the geography that they had in relatively short order adapting to it and figuring out ways to fight effectively in those circumstances. Um, some of the, uh, the raising of militias, the, the fact that uh, one's had prominent bloggers with military backgrounds raising units that then the Ministry of Defense co-ops into the army or that the Svoboda Svo, 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 party was able to raise a unit that then received Ukrainian military intelligence patronage are cases in some ways of bottom-up or uh, adaptation because they come from individual initiatives that then go, get co-opted by the high command. And then we've also seen element, um, evidence of horizontal adaptation. These, in the early battles, one saw considerable evidence of units that had engaged Russian armor sending text messages and recording TikTok videos and transmitting those to the next unit over to give tips on how do you engage, you know, let the Russian tanks pass and then engage the soft skin vehicles or this is the way that you want to take, if you have end laws and javelins in your possession, this is the way that you want to take on the armored spearheads. So we saw evidence for all of these existing patterns of adaptation. But what we also saw was evidence of a type of adaptation that doesn't exist in the pre-existing uh, scholarly literature. And we've been referring to this as cross-cutting adaptations. And Kristen will explain this more fully afterwards, but basically what a cross-cutting adaptation is, is it's an adaptation that is enabled by civil society, some group that sits outside of the formal military command but that it is both receiving information from lower levels of the military command, uh, from the military hierarchy, and is also interacting with higher levels of it. Um, and this is a way that we've seen that in a, in a pluralistic digital society like Ukraine's, it's actually quite possible for civil society, NGOs, and charities to play a powerful enabling role in the adaptation process. Um, and we're going to present two cases of it, and then we're going to try to theorize a little bit about the broader, uh, about the broader phenomena that we're seeing. So the first example is Delta. Um, now, Delta is, as the Russians attempted to blitzkrieg towards Kiev a little bit less than a year ago, they were met by surprisingly effective resistance. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that resistance, says success, but one of those is that Ukrainian units had an app that was centralizing data from a variety of, of sources, including drones, satellite data that was fed to them probably by some of their friends, um, reports by soldiers who were in contact, as well as reports from civilians who'd been vetted by uh, Ukrainian intelligence services. So one had a cloud-based app synthesizing targeting data and feeding it to frontline Ukrainian soldiers, and this data could be seen on any mobile phone, as well as any laptop or iPad type of device. Now, this made it easier for the Ukrainians to concentrate scarce resources 
where the, it would be, they would be most effective against uh, the Russian spearhead. Delta was in a very nascent early stage in February and March of 2022. It became widely available in August of 2022, and it's been in February of 2023 that the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense has announced Delta's full-scale implementation throughout uh, Ukraine's armed forces, and also the fact that the cloud service is partly being based uh, abroad at this moment. But the interesting thing is that Delta's, the impetus for Delta and its development doesn't fit either top-down or bottom-up dynamics. In fact, Delta was originally developed by essentially a civil society NGO. In May of 2014, a number of individuals led by an investment banker, Volodymyr Kochetkov Sukac, created an NGO called Aurora Zvedka. Uh, Zvedka. Now, Aurora Zvedka started by working on drones, you know, trying to jury rig drones that would help improve Ukrainian military performance. And then they moved from that to try and create apps and ways of better synthesizing the data coming from drones. Now, very quickly, Aurora's Vidka becomes complicated because it simultaneously becomes part of the military, but it also becomes a full-fledged NGO. So in December 2015, the full-time employees of Aurora's Vidka are assimilated into a military unit that's given the code name uh, or number of A2724. But shortly thereafter, Aurora Zvidka also registers the part-time and affiliates of it as a Ukrainian NGO. So the same organization is simultaneously part of the Ministry of Defense, but it's also operating as a network NGO, and that enables it to both very agilely access Ukraine's great, you know, tech computing uh, sector and very quickly procure equipment and rush stuff through development, while at the same time being able to access MOD resources to diffuse the, the, uh, the adaptation throughout the system. So this hybrid type of organization that is neither military unit nor traditional NGO, but some hybrid of the two, enables Ukraine to rush into uh, production and widespread distribution, a real-time kill chain type of system uh, that would be the envy of many militaries with uh, much greater R&D budgets. A second type of example of this phenomena is Ukraine and drones. Uh, here, it's much more diffuse. There's over 100 drone workshops, some literally based in garages, where tinkerers and techies are modifying drones based on information coming from frontline units, often by social media. But the MOD is facilitating this by putting testing facilities at their disposal and also put, giving them access to higher cost assets like 3D printers so that it's easy to diffuse and experiment with innovations between one gr drone working group and another. Uh, and on the light tactical dr drones, actually, the charity sector is playing a predominant role in the procurement. So in some ways, this rapid adaptation of Ukraine's drone forces and their rapid modification is being empowered by this relationship between civil society, frontline units, and the MOD playing a facilitating role at the higher level. Um, so now I'm going to turn over to Kristen to try to walk us through what this means in theoretical terms for our understanding of military adaptation. All right, and here's where things get a bit speculative. So what, what we're observing is we're thinking there might be something new afoot. Um, that what we're seeing is civilian networks 
that are cross-cutting across military hierarchies and that they're able to talk to the people at the very top, the people in the middle, the frontline units, right? And they're able to do that very rapidly and very quickly and therefore serve to disseminate and push forward ideas um, in ways that we potentially haven't seen in the past uh, and in ways that might be a lot more rapid and a lot more conducive um, to learning than, than past mechanisms. They might be bad on other fronts, but at least to get innovative ideas pushed out, th this might be a very good thing. But we also think that there are a lot of conditions around where this is going to work and what enables it, right? Uh, we are in um, a new kind of technological era, at least vis-a-vis -vis communications. So open IT, social media, right? This ability to communicate rapidly and quickly and get information to people um, is vital to this functioning. We also think that the nature of the society, that there has to be at least some level of internet, media, and speech freedoms, right? Civilians can't be afraid to communicate and to communicate ideas with, um, with politicians, with the government, with the military, to, to criticize what's out there, to say this doesn't work or we think we can do better. Um, there has to be a level of linkage between civil society and the military, Right, if, if the civilian networks aren't connected in to the military institution, it's not going to work. They can't serve that cross-cutting function. Um, so you have to have these either pre-existing dense links between civilian networks and the military, or they have to arise within the context of the war. And the civilian organizations need some level of access to battlefield information, whether that's coming through open source, through social media, through Twitter, or it's coming through their access to frontline units. Um, and that that's the particularly the case in a war like the one going on in Ukraine, where civilians are on the ground in the battlefield zones, right? They have direct access to information and are often sources of information themselves. So, and there may be more requirements than, than this. We're still thinking through it. But this isn't just, it doesn't just automatically or spontaneously happen just because we're in a new digital age of communications. Um, we also think that some of these requirements mean that, uh, if we're right about this, and if these civilian cross-cutting networks are really helping to facilitate learning, Ukraine is going to be better at learning than Russia in this war, a lot better. And that actually democracies might be gaining an advantage in military learning in the new communications era um, because they allow for free speech, criticism, and non-hierarchical links between civil society and the military. That they, they, it is in this context, in a democratic or democratizing, um, you know, we can argue back and forth about what, whether we'd consider Ukraine a democracy before this war broke out, but they were at least democratizing and liberalizing, and so they were allowing a certain amount of freedom. Um, and, and that really may be necessary. Uh, there's a constraint on this that the civilian side needs access to that battlefield information. If you're overly secretive or you're hiding that information, it's not going to happen. Um, and democracies can be secretive and hide information too. Um, and that, that the effectiveness of this is heightened by that direct civilian contact with frontline units and soldiers. You're not going to get that in an expeditionary war or an aggressive war or an invasion. And so we're actually most likely to see this kind of learning in wars of territorial defense, in, in democracies defending themselves. Um, and if that's the case, then that has lessons moving forward. It has lessons for, you know, thinking about the direction of the war in Ukraine. It has lessons for thinking about what would happen in Taiwan if there was an invasion. It had, you know, it has lessons for thinking about what would happen if Russia invaded another neighboring state. Um, but again, this is this is quite speculative now. So we look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you.
Okay, we have heard quite interesting presentation uh, also from the, let's say, theoretical and military political uh, grounds for, for, for situation in, in, in Ukraine and around it and an interesting learning process in the end. So, but, but now we have some, some 30 minutes for, for discussions, comments and, and questions. Please. Does Kiev heard me? Did Kiev hear anything? I, uh, may I start I, 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 from the from the last presentation? Very interesting theoretical. Uh, uh, do, do, uh, do, uh, is this a preliminary phase for for this kind of research? And and do you have the uh, 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 plans to 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 mirror it to to the Russian side? Um. Thanks, Menti. This is definitely in a preliminary phase, and we intend to do far more research to both explore in greater depth the Ukrainian side, and we have a trip planned um, over there in the nearish future. We would be very interested to discuss the Russian case because originally we were planning on doing a comparative case example. Um, now, so far, we have only written up the Ukrainian case thus far because that's the only case where with Terrace's research we sort of were able to pick apart the innovative pathways. With the Russian case, I guess what we're faced with is that any evidence of adaptation is purely inductive. I mean, clearly they're, they're adapting. We can see evidence for top-down adaptations such as the purchase of Iranian drones, such as some of the technical modifications that they've conducted, uh, the anti their campaign against civilian infrastructure. One can see some adaptations which are one can't tell whether they're bottom up or top down, such as the use of Wagner convicts or uh, DNR, LNR troops as basically cannon fodder to force Ukrainians to disclose the location of their main lines of resistance and heavy weaponry to then allow for targeting. But we really haven't gotten inside that black box of how are the Russians adapting. Um, we certainly have not seen any t evidence for this type of cross-cutting adaptation, but we would love to talk to anybody who's looking at the Russian side of adaptation and would like to make this comparative if the data is there uh, to make it truly comparative. Thank you. Let's start here on the, on the okay, the microphone is there, Rod, please. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Rod Thorns on King's College London. Uh, thanks very much for all the presentations this morning, very interesting. I just want to ask uh, Mark and Kristen specifically, the, cha the literature on, the, on changing military organizations talks about the difference between adaptation and innovation. And so what I'm thinking here is, is your grounding in terms of definitions. How are you defining, and you use both these terms, adaptation and innovation, kind of interchangeably. But there is a kind of difference in the literature on between adaptation and uh, innovation. I just wondered if you could consider that. My second issue was with, not an issue, it's a question. It's about, have you considered the advice that um, foreign military organizations would be giving to the Ukrainians. Say, Why don't you do this, right? So foreign observers, I don't know, Americans, British, whatever, they might look at what the Ukrainians are doing and say, why don't you do this better by doing this? So just, just an issue that you might want to consider further in your research, but thank you. Well, if I said innovation, that's uh, a sort of uh, lapsus. Uh, we meant to ground ourselves very clearly in the adaptation 
literature, given the fact that I've previously published on innovation, um, sometimes I accidentally say innovation. But for anybody who's not grounded in this literature, the difference between innovation and adaptation is both real but also fuzzy in the literature. Uh, adaptations tend to be considered to be more incremental and the result of learning during conflict. Whereas innovations tend to be viewed as, you know, bigger, more discontinuous, and more frequent to occur in peacetime. Um, so off, there's a lot of cases where it's difficult to say whether something is an innovation or an adaptation, but there are sort of Weberian ideal types where that is a clear definition. In some cases like Delta, Delta's developmental process looks like an adaptation, but the sum product of it may actually be viewed as an innovation. So even here, there are cases that get into that fuzzy ground between what is an adaptation and what's an uh, innovation. Um, and yes, we, we are fully aware that Ukraine's foreign partners are providing them with advice. We were trying to focus on areas where that was less of an issue um, but yes, we've, we've been involved with our Ukrainian partners and are well aware that yeah, one of their key competences is taking the best advice they're being given and ignoring the stupid advice they're being given. Kristen. Well, I was going to say that I was actually more intentionally mudding the oh. waters between the terminology insofar that, so having worked uh, for a time on trying to develop a pilot scheme to code data on adapt on innovation uh yeah it's uh, definitions out there border on tautology um is that something's an innovation when it creates this disruptive massive change um which almost precludes even thinking about failed innovation from a research design perspective, I'm like, where are my negative cases? And, and the very definition kind of precludes that. But another part of the way in which we have traditionally defined innovation is it would actually, I think, not be possible to know yet on a lot of these, whether they will ultimately be considered innovations or whether they, they meet that bar. So I guess I was coming from the perspective of let's think about learning, regardless of whether how we ultimately classify a particular new practice or technology as innovation or adaptation. Let's just think about how we're learning. Thank you. And then uh, Marina there, the next to take in order, then we come to Neil. Um, thank you very much for your presentations. It was a pleasure to listen to something more kind of operational tactical when it comes to Ukraine. Um, I'm Marina Myron from King's College London, War Studies. My question is to the last panel, to Mark and Kristen, about the methodology. So the, uh, f the first thing I was wondering about, and you've just briefly addressed it, in terms of adaptation, how do you measure the outputs and how do you quantify them? I.e., let's say Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian armed forces have adopted a certain tactic. How does that translate on the battlefield? This is a kind of a so what question. You know, so th that's the first bit. And, and, and the second bit is indeed how do you think of quantifying it to make it comparable because I'm looking at the Russian side and you know we we can say you know observing the conflict as it goes on how the Russians were adapting to the introduction of drones and you were talking about the kind of commercially modified drones from Aerosvitka and how the Russians were trying to solve their capabilities gap and how they kind of implemented the lessons learned as they went. So we can actually trace it back by looking at the conflict or how did they adapt to the appearance of HIMARS on the battlefield. So 
What do you think? How would you quantify it to make it comparable? Thank you. Um, I mean, we'd love to quantify it to make it uh, to make it more comparable. Now, this is very much a first cut, and probably some of the metrics needed to properly quantify will not be available until after the war. Um, but we would, yeah, we would love to have a chat with you, and it's probably not that difficult because you're over in Shrivenham and we're in London frequently with our um, other roles. Um, but yes, we would like to get at this dyadic action-reaction type of uh, dynamic because that's what competitive adaptation and conflict is uh, is about. And um, yeah, and obviously it would be nice to be able to quantify and to have a nice graph of uh, the number of the average number of sorties that a drone survives for, or. Uh, the percentage of drones that are being used for ISR versus uh, dropping bombs, or um, yeah, the the percentage of uh, the number of Delta operating devices per battalion. Um, so I can think of a lot of ways that I'd like to quantify it. I can't think of any of those today that I would have any chance in hell of getting the the data for. Yeah. I, there are a lot of tricky issues to sort through with thinking about outcomes, like what what would it mean? Because I think you're getting at, are these adaptations successful or not? Um, because an adaptation or learning doesn't have to be good. It doesn't have to be successful. It doesn't have to automatically translate. You know, some of the some ideas out there are ludicrous and actually harm right military effectiveness. And so there is there is a a whole element of thinking about how does this contribute to military effectiveness that's really hard to gauge. Battle outcomes are complex, right? Even even at um, even at the tactical or battle level, as opposed to thinking operational or strategic, it's very complex to think about what contributes to a particular outcome on the ground and how a particular kind of adaptation may have contributed to that. If you're thinking about improved performance, that's a, so a lot of the metrics that Mark was talking about are maybe about improved performance of a piece of kit based on the adaptations occurring. That's easier to get at. Um, I think as a first cut, we were avoiding the outcome side and just thinking about are, are the institutions able to learn? whatever happens to those lessons. Um, because that in itself is generally deemed important. To be a learning organization is generally going to help you versus being unable to learn on the battlefield because the quantification issues are really tricky. Really, really, really tricky. And the outcome issues are tricky. Thank you. And then there is in front uh, John and, and Leon, uh, if we take those two questions in a row and, yeah. Um, Ivan, this is actually a question for you. Thank you uh, for your presentation. Um, this sounds like a bit of a simple question, but I'd be interested in your thoughts on it. As Russia finds that it's not able to provide the weapons that it has promised or have already been paid for, um, and since that is a significant pillar of its outreach to the Global South, how do you think that's going to affect Russia's ability to influence? And again, I realize it, it's kind of a simple question, but based on your research, I think you can add quite a bit to that. Thank you. And Leonid, please. Uh, Leonid Nersissian, University of Birmingham. Uh, I want to ask Mark and Kristen, uh, not even ask, but just an idea. Uh, may, are you going to try to do a qual quantitative research on the on the civilian help which is going on and which is more or less available in open sources? The, how much was fundraised, for example, and how many, for example, DJI Mavic drones were uh, supplied to Ukrainian armed forces? How significant these numbers are? Thanks. Thank you. Ivan, could, could you start? 
Certainly. Thank you for that question. Uh, I think it's, it's kind of a simple question, but it is actually a very key issue because, as you correctly point out, it's a key vector of uh, Russia's engagement with the global south is through these uh, weapons transfers. Um, I, I think it, it's been hard to get a really global picture because um, a lot of the information that has surfaced is uh, uh, quite, um, suggests that it's quite it's quite fragmented and kind of varies so, uh, by so many of Russia's partners. Uh, there's been reports that uh, since the expulsion of Russia from SWIFT, payments have become harder, and just generally the kind of financial system doesn't really uh, facilitate the type of exchange of money that uh, was happening before. Um, even with countries that have not imposed uh, sanctions on Russia, which is most of the global south, um, because of this, uh, uh, and because of the or, uh, already existing sanctions and the potential of secondary sanctions, uh, kind of uh, this has discouraged many uh, former partners of Russia. Uh, that said, uh, I was recently in India asking precisely about whether Russia would continue to be seen as a reliable partner, and uh, there's a. My impression is that there's a wait and see attitude. We'll see how the war turns out, what, how it affects supply chains, how it, how, how um, because even even in peacetime, Russia was not an entirely reliable supplier. There would be uh, holdups, uh, quality kind of not up to to kind of what was promised. Uh, so in a way, there is a uh, uh, there there is some remaining goodwill in that sense, and there's the. Kind of the traditional partners are used to being uh, sometimes let down. So, uh, so that that's kind of a diffused answer. Um, I, I, from what I've seen, it it uh, it will remain an important vector of of relations. Um, but uh, uh, indeed, for at least for the short term, there's a question of how uh, how much patience will Russia's partner uh, continue to have. Thank you. Then here in the front, and, and you. Uh, thank you all presenters for very, very good presentations and uh, opening my eyes to new issues. Um, I have one question for Ivan and one for um, Mark and Kristen. Ivan, uh, you said that this could be a, a, a an area where we will have surprises. Now you tickled my imagination. Could you just speculate what such a surprise might actually be, more specifically? I would love to hear that because uh, that would be very, very interesting. And for Mark and Kristen, um, this idea with the, the, um, the Delta system, um, it sounds great, almost too good to be true. But there must be setbacks, flaws, vulnerabilities to EW. Can it be hacked? Um, has it been always that good? Uh, I'm just curious to see about the, the specifics of it as well. And I have some ideas about the Russian side, but we can do that afterwards. Thanks. Thank you. And then give it yeah, a few rows back. Yeah. Um, many thanks for very uh, ins insightful presentations. Uh, uh, I, I'm curious um, uh, about the how Russia's cooperation with those particular countries that you selected, how do they fit into the Russia's kind of a global strategy? Because we, we, we know a lot about speculative ideas, you know, why Russia would engage into military cooperation with a number of countries across the globe. But based on the data you collected in those four particular countries, what are the insights about the, you know, particular uh, design rationale of Russia in those regions in relation with those countries. And uh, another question to uh, uh, Mark and, and, and Kristen. Um, have you thought about uh, maybe connecting you, the conceptual framework of adaptation with uh, the, the logic and conceptual framework of uh, outsourcing or crowdsourcing? Because there is some literature there and the, 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 I, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know the specifics of your research, but there might be a way to connect the two in particular since uh, uh, th this particular adaptation that you're looking at involves basically civil society a lot. 
in, in a way, logically it could be that maybe that's a unintended uh, uh, instance of crowdsourcing, you know, from the state to the, uh, uh, the, the those groups. Um, that's one thing, and also a second one. I, I wonder, maybe I I was unable to grasp this from your presentation, uh, and if you if you cover this, forgive me. Uh, but I wonder if you have figured out what are other drivers um, that make uh, this particular adaptation uh, that you are interested in the new one uh, more likely and whether how, how this those drivers actually can be uh, consciously uh, trigger generated by policymakers to encourage uh, uh, this kind of adaptation more widely thank you thank you Ivan could you, could you start yes Thank you for this very interesting question. Uh, I, I will start with a surprise question, um, uh, and I think uh, to give a very very short answer, I, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the, the Sahel, which is a region that has already been um, where we, Russia is already very present in Mali. Uh, we believe that maybe something is going on in Burkina Faso. Lavrov was just in uh, Mauritania. Um, if when you think of Chad, that it's kind of a pillar of uh, that, that kind of the, the mili French military bases there are kind of a uh, a pillar for French kind of military projection in the broader area. But Chad is surrounded by Libya. Where the, there's of course a Russian presence there, Sudan and Central African Republic. Um, so uh, kind of I, I I think that's a, that's an area where uh, we need to keep an eye out for, uh, so to speak. Um, when it comes to the broader strategy, uh, well, thank you for this question uh, because it allows me to kind of elaborate a bit more on what I was saying about grand strategy, uh, which was indeed something I didn't quite uh, 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 spoke much about. Um, and I will, I will ta also talk about how those four cases fit in there. Um, uh, so this, this presentation was about military cooperation specifically. And it's, as I mentioned, it's in the framework of a broader present, uh, research on Russia and the Global South. Um, I think a, a, a very important driver, and it's something that I will develop in uh, further writing uh, later this year or maybe next year, is that uh, I, I believe, and I think in my own assessment, uh, uh, it's, that it's, uh, uh, Russia's driven to engage the Global South, or the way it uh, kind of evinces um, uh, uh, reflects its uh, foreign policy, its uh, aggressive orientation in its foreign policy, um, because its engagements where it actually puts its attention, Russia puts its uh, uh, its attention are uh, areas that kind of contribute to its confrontation with the West, uh, displacing, uh, kind of uh, uh, undermining Western reputation through its media and disinformation and uh, propaganda. Uh, under undermining Western presence in, in uh, other parts of the world, um, and I can I can go on. Um, and these four countries, uh, up until the 2021 coup, really Myanmar was the only one that had uh, kind of positive relations with the West uh, relatively recently. But since 2022, none of them have positive relations with the West. So these four countries are among those close Russian partners that uh, share certain uh, elements in their worldview, uh, uh, especially uh, kind of a confrontational stance towards uh, towards <coughs> the West and uh, towards the current uh, international order. So, uh, and kind of Russia's cooperation with them and enabling them as uh, in their own uh, quest for uh, survival, in, especially in the case of Myanmar and uh, Venezuela, uh, kind of contributes to Russia's overall uh, aggressive uh, grand strategy. Okay. Um, so maybe I'll take on the methodology again. I think this project. So, 
this project has really in many ways started at a thick descriptive level. It's mapping. It's what's happening, what's going on. Um, what are the adaptations we're seeing and, and, you know, what's the process behind them? And then we've gotten to a stage having done some of that. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we have a universal or comprehensive mapping yet. So, that, so that's kind of phase one is probably developing a more systematic mapping. Um, and, and more will get added to that every, you know, as the war progresses, there progresses, there will be more and more kind of uh, instances of learning. Then we're sort of reached a phase of what I call inductive theorization, right? Theory building. We're seeing things uh, that don't fit with existing theory. And so, so that's a phase of kind of building up an idea of what we are seeing and how it's new and how it's different. And then um, you're then you're talking uh, toward a quantitative phase of research that that you know that theory those theoretical insights have to be much more well developed before one can even think about what metrics you would want to gather to test it um, and to think about the research questions that would come out of that. So are we interested? For example, off the top of my head, if we're interested in does, do these civilian cross-cutting networks, do you, adaptations coming out of those, do they occur faster, right? Are they implemented faster than other types of learning? Well, then we need data on speed of, right, speed from idea to implementation. Um, are they more effective? Then you need some sort of comparable data on how they're impacting actual uh, outcomes or, you know, performance in the field. So I think there are lots of research questions that could be asked that would require then collecting the quantitative data and figuring out what's out in the public sphere, what we have access to that would be feasible. So I think, you know, this is great insofar as there seem to be a lot of ideas and a lot of interest for a lot of papers. So I guess I will take those questions from the opposite realm since Kristen started with the conceptual. I'll start with the very uh, concrete. On the questions about are there problems with Delta, at, well, yes, there are. Uh, as we've seen with any major adaptation slash innovation that is quickly rushed into production, um, things don't work perfect initially. Uh, yeah. And in some ways, one can think of the, fir the use of the first tanks on the Somme in September of 1916, where half of them broke down before they even made it to the British front line, uh, let alone the German front line, is a case for this type of teething problem uh, with adaptations. Now, what's in the public domain with Delta is that while it was very effective in helping coordinate the, op the operations against the Kiev column uh, in February, um, early March, that also sort of exceeded the bandwidth and capabilities of, uh, of the cloud computing aspects of uh, Delta at that time. So it was successful, but it also pushed it to and perhaps beyond the limits. Also, the Russians obviously see there as being some cyber vulnerabilities. On the 2nd of February 2023, so just a little bit over a week ago, they attempted a hack against Delta using a pirated email account um, from the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense. Now, whether that hack succeeded or not, I don't know. But obviously, Delta having been pushed into and having evolved so quickly um, had both issues in terms of capacity and and has at least some perceived vulnerabilities that the adversary is attempting to exploit. Um, then getting to uh, Dimitro's sort of uh, issues about crowdsourcing, there is certainly an element of crowdsourcing, and that's probably an analogous literature. So if you have set any what you think of would be good, yeah, you know, good articles that you think we should engage in from the sort of political economy or business management literature on how crowdsourcing shapes the behavior of NGOs or other social dynamics, 
please let us know and we'd be happy to engage with this because that's obviously part of the story and an analogy to something that's happening. But obviously this is different because it's NGOs and charities participating in doing this for a military at war. Um, then if we were to get to the question that Leone mentioned about gathering uh, data, as Kristen mentioned, we're not quite to that stage yet, but if anybody has sources of data, please feed them to us because we would love to have data on things like the procurement by NGOs um, and other non-governmental actors. Now that's complex because there's a, no, there's a number of them act, active. Come Back to Alive, the Pertula Foundation, um, Aurora uh, Svedka, um, as well as a lot of smaller, more gra grassroots, and even individuals and small groups financing, um, you know, a drone for their squad. Um, so aggregating that data is going to be difficult, and getting data from NGOs when these organizations are already overstretched and have limited bandwidth is probably challenging, but it's obviously something we should aim for, and if anybody has that data, even if it's for one or two organizations, um, yeah, please, please send us an email, and we would love to chat with you and get your data. Thank you. Thank you. And further questions? Yes, please. Hello, um, I'm Steve Ball. I'm the UK Defence Attaché here. I'm speaking in a personal capacity. Um, is your research uh, essentially boiling down to uh, an observation that an NGO or civil organisation is unconstrained by the need to assure that their innovation and adaption is safe, uh, isn't going to harm people? It, it, is that what the research is going to boil down to? I mean, I think that's a concern, right? So to say that the cross-cutting networks can get ideas out there faster doesn't mean that's a good thing, right? Um, now, in in the context of a war, you know, a war for national survival, you may want to make some shortcuts. So I, the idea, I think the idea is that the networks can cut across typical bureaucratic hierarchies and chains of command. And some of the things that we've, I think, personally observed uh, is uh, not just within militaries, but within civilian bureaucracies as well, is that there, there is uh, some kind of value to getting an idea pushed forward, to having networks that can come in and talk to the different levels. So we've, we've heard it expressed by high-level people like, oh, it would be great if, you know, that idea could, could get disseminated at lower levels, so I have organizational buy-in for what I want to do. And we've heard it expressed by people at low levels while I'm struggling to get an idea up the chain. So the, the civilian networks may not even have original ideas. They may be ideas that exist within the organizations in some place. But the ability to disseminate that idea and get buy-in across levels can help an idea move forward. Um, now, whether that then shortcuts other important processes, I think, is an open question. And whether you would want that in peacetime is a whole nother question, right? Like in peacetime, there can be high value to slow methodical process. Yeah, I would, I would basically echo all of that. It, it seems to me that conceptually NGOs and the civil society sector's involvement is playing two roles. One is, as you said, it's allow, it's creating an avenue for basically quickly flipping a switch and moving out of the peacetime procurement mode. And as you know, and as anybody who's been involved in peacetime procurement projects know, the sort of fail-safe budgeting cycles, planning cycles, 
means that there's a certain level of assuredness, but that also strips it of a certain level of uh, dynamism. And, and even when our militaries created you know, fast tracks to getting weapons into the field or urgent procurement during things like Iraq and Afghanistan, it was not nearly as fast as would have been necessary for a high intensity conventional war. You know, if we look at how long did it take to actually get MRAPs being uh, sourced and the MRAP procurement contracts, even though that was a mature technology that places like South Africa were already building, it was years. And that was the fast track of trying to have very good Western MODs uh, fast track equipment into production. So in some ways, it is the lack of bureaucracy which does carry more risk of an individual project failing um, that is one of the beauties of this in wartime. I think another one is what Kristen was alluding to is that standard military organizations operate very much by hierarchy, which oftentimes means that feedback from the battlefield goes through an almost Chinese telephone before it arrives at top echelons. And in a way, uh, the, sir, the civil society organizations are interacting directly with um, sergeants, lieutenants, mobilized reservists on the front line, taking their feedback and trying to action on it as opposed to waiting for it to reach a much higher level echelon of command that then that idea has been filtered, somewhat changed and delayed before um, action is taken. Uh, so I think there's these two functions of bucking the chain of command and accelerating the process by cutting corners that civil society plays in this process. Thank you. I think we are running out of time. Uh, and, and I got the impression that, that there would be even more questions and, and, and answers to be, to be made in the future. So I think we will continue next year in the same venues. <laughs> so I, I, it's, I personally thank the speakers all in, in Kiev also uh, to, in taking part in our seminar. And we give a big hand to all of you. And now we have a, a, a few minutes break just to stretch our legs and, and, and uh, wash hands and, and we resume in, in five minutes the same place here for the, for the closing words. Thank you.
What a seminar. It's indeed my pleasure to make few closing remarks and express gratitude to all those who made this seminar a reality. Venti told a story yesterday about his meeting with General Karasimov. I want to tell you a story as well from Moscow. This story came up to my mind yesterday when we were elaborated prediction outcomes in war and overestimation the Russian military capabilities. In late 2021, just some months before the Russian unlawful military aggression, I had a chance to sit at the dinner table next to a former head of SVR. We were talking around the table about the tense situation, Russian actions and capabilities of the Russian armed forces. All of a sudden, this army general turned to me and said, Colonel, you as an officer, you should understand that Russian armed forces could defeat and occupy Baltic states within 48 hours, if we want to do that. Was that an, an example of overestimation of own capabilities? I could say, highly likely so. And I can say, likely, we will never see the real results. I would like to thank you all, the speakers, your remarkable professionalism, expertise, excellent thought-provoking talks, Simo and your team, and the session chairpersons for organizing the sessions and keeping things both under control and reasonable on time. However, most importantly, I would like to thank you all, the participants, without your input and discussion, this, this seminar would not have been success it has. We have already heard very complete summarize, summaries from the session chairpersons, and I will not even try to re repeat them here. Instead, I would like to share with you my personal view of the seminar. We have covered the Russian aggression in Ukraine, Russian military capabilities and society from many different point of views and perspectives. This seminar opened my eyes and my knowledge increased about how little I know about Russia and its society and military nuances. Here in Finland we say macaroni expanded. It doesn't really say anything in English, but uh, you can imagine what does it mean. Words like large-scale aggression, hybrid warfare, cognitive sphere, kinetic, non-kinetic, conventional, non-conventional weapons, partial success by deterring the red lines, escalation ladders, limited space-based assets, sanctions and brain drain, privatization of the warfare, lack of interoperability and coordination, multi-domain operations, military adaptation. These words kept coming back in many of the discussions when you assessed the performance of the Russian armed forces. But what will happen next? That's the big question. What kind of posture 
deterrence posture Russia will have in the future and what could surprise us. Someone mentioned that in the future we should not underestimate Russian military capability which is connected with Russian fatalism. Things are now bad, so it doesn't matter if they are going from bad to worse. We can only hope that the situation does not develop to this point. I'm very happy that we exceeded expectations in all respects here in the meeting room and online. During the sessions and outside here in the beautiful, on the beautiful island of Santa Hamina and socially in the wilderness of the city of Helsinki. I hope that the contacts that have been made here will continue in the future as I'm convinced that they are very useful. Once again, thank you so much to each of one of you here in this room and there online. See you again in exactly one year at this same place. Have a safe trip back home. So with these words, I declare the seminar closed. Thank you all.